forgot to turn on the mic. What causes us to get ahead of God is we listen to other people yeah. instead of God. We are deceived by appearances rather than making choices based on the will of God. So how do you know what the will of God is? Well, you open your Bible and you read it. The word will come alive to you if you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his will to you. I know that a lot of people say that they hear from God, that they heard from God, maybe audibly or in visions or dreams. But you know, he really speaks to us through his word. And that is why we have the Bible. For many years, generations span lifetime, I mean, the Bible is continuous and consistent. It is written by both man and God. It was not written by a horse, right? It is written by a man during such a time when God impressed upon their hearts, breathed by God, inspired by God. And so at that time, during that time, when they were in that lifetime, which is still pertinent today, because God's word, his will, doesn't change. We get ahead of God because we become impatient. And we impose a time limit unto the Lord. He doesn't have a timetable. We do not schedule or the other way around. He does not schedule anything on our time. His ways and his thoughts are way higher and much better than ours. So the bottom line is problem is unbelief. The problem is unbelief. We don't believe that God has a plan for our individual lives, so we discount God's will for us. That's why we make things happen when it's not happening. You know, when God bolts the door in, don't try to climb in through a window, okay? When he bolts it in, that means he's saying, wait, or no, that is not my plan for you. That is not the way that I have for you. But we get so impatient and so carnal and so just wanting to help God, right? Anybody been there? We want to help him by doing it our way, and we convince him that it was his will. So what is the penalty for not waiting on God? We deny ourselves his best. We delay God's purpose in our life. You know, taking a wrong turn could delay into getting our, to our destiny. It delays the completion of God's will for us. I don't know about you, but I don't want to take a lot of detours because I want to get to where God is taking me at his appointed time. I don't want to keep having God to clean up messes after messes because I am not cooperating. See, God does not need my help. He needs my obedience. He needs my trust. He needs me to believe him when I don't know what to do, when I don't know what steps are next, when I'm feeling like I'm in the dark, but he is the light. So in essence, if God, the Holy Spirit is living inside of me, then he will direct my path. And absence or silence does not mean absence. Even though I may not be hearing or seeing him in things, he is still with me. You know, that's kind of like a poor prayer when we say, God, please be with me. Really? Over and over and over again in the Bible, he says, I am with you and I will be with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if he's already with us, why are we still praying, you know, God be with me today? It's because we're making plans on our own and we're saying, God, be with me in my own way. I want you to come with me, okay? I want to take the wheel and drive myself and you be the passenger. We delay God's purpose in our life. We experience disharmony. Wrong choices 
does not just, do not just affect you. Wrong choices affect people around you. They will create situations that bring discord to our lives. Think about this. Marrying someone that is not God's pick for you will affect your life forever. It will affect your family forever. It will affect your friends forever. So think about that before you start making a list for your wedding plan. Amen. We may satisfy ourselves for a season, but not in accordance with God's will. And ultimately, it will bring disappointment. You know, there's a difference between the perfect will of God and the permissive will of God. Where would you rather be in? Permissive will of God simply means he just hasn't shown judgment yet or applied judgment. He's allowing things to happen and because he's a gracious and merciful God. But wouldn't you rather be in his perfect will rather than his permissive will? We experience defeat and destruction. If we can go to uh, 1 Samuel 13, 8 through 14. This is the story about Samuel, or I'm sorry, Saul, not obeying God's specific instructions. Okay, are you there? 1 Samuel 13, 8 through 14. Saul waited seven days according to the set time Samuel had appointed. So he's waiting for the prophet. But Samuel was delayed, had not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from Saul. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering, which he was forbidden to do. And just as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Saul went out to meet and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines were assembled at Michmash, I thought the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord, so I forced myself, I forced myself to offer a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now, listen to this, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out David, a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince and ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. What a price to pay for getting ahead of God. And why? Because he was feeling peer pressure from the people. He was expected to act somehow, somehow he did. And, you know, because he was trying to please the people instead of waiting on God. You know, I read some, somewhere um, recently, and I was told also by a wise man that if you do not know what to do, and if you've not heard any other direction from God, stay put and continue to do what you're doing. Don't change your course. Don't try to make things happen on your own if you are in the path and in the will of God. You know, how long did Abraham wait? 25 years to wait for the promised son. And we all know the story. We all know what happened. You know, he was a faithful, devoted man. He wasn't always a believer. He was a pagan, but God chose him. Okay, I mean, a series of events. First, he called him out from his own country, and he followed, but not fully, because he was told to leave his countrymen and 
travel alone. But what did he do? He took his nephew Lot with him. Okay, which will cause him trouble later on. Okay, and so a few verses down in Genesis, the story goes to say that there was a great famine in the land where he was brought to by God in Canaan. I mean, he followed, he was trusting God, right? He didn't know, God did not tell him where to go. How do you like that? He did not tell you, if he instructs you to go, go leave Castro Valley, pack up and go somewhere north. But he doesn't tell you where. And he finally gets you to that place. So you were trusting, you were following, and now there's a famine. Just a few verses down, as he was trusting him, now he flees to Egypt. God didn't tell him to go to Egypt, but he made other plans and arrangements because he panicked, right? And then just it's down spiraling from there. Then he lied to the king, Abimelech, right? He lied because he thought that his wife was gorgeous, you know? He, she was hot even though she was in her 60s, okay? And she t he told her to tell the king, and they told the king that, you know, Sarah was his half-sister. Well, that's not all a lie because Sarah was his half-sister. But nevertheless, Sarah was his wife. Okay, but they told the king that, you know, she's a sister so that it may be well with him. <clears throat> he was being selfish. He was only thinking about himself. He didn't think about Sarah, his wife, what's going to happen, that what he's, she's going to be in the king's chambers. Good Lord. You know, and so that the king will treat me well. So, you know, but later for you, wifey, right? It's kind of like, wait, Abraham. What are you doing? And so what happens? Because Sarah, I mean, Abraham did not stand up for Sarah. God had to intervene again. God had to save Sarah. So he caused plagues to the, to the Egyptians. Just the household, the palace was you know, afflicted with boils or some sort. And it's only happening to them. So they figured out that, what have you done? Because the Hebrews weren't being affected. So, you know, they got found out, and that caused a great humiliation to, to Abraham and his clan and to the God he serves, right? That was like a total defamation of character by misrepresenting God because he got ahead of God. And so, you know, and guess what? who they took with them, Hagar, the Egyptian maid servant. And so 10 years more later, there's still, they're still not a promised son born. Now Sarah, probably he's getting even, but anyway, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Sarah, you know, convinces Abraham, I'm sure she didn't do very hard convincing, because he gladly obliged to have Hagar conceive, you know, his son. And so she does. She conceives a son. And now, of course, Hagar probably got a little puffy, you know, you know, puffed up because, hey, I'm pregnant and you're not, you know. I'm going to have a baby and you're not. So Sarah got highly upset and offended. Of course, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, you're waiting for the promised son and she's pregnant and you're not and you're still waiting and, you know, you're thinking, hey, I'm, I'm getting up there in age. So she tells Abraham this problem and then passive-aggressive Abraham said, hey, she's your mistress. You deal with her the way you want to, right? So she did. She became, Sarah became really harsh on Hagar and so Hagar fled. But God's merciful and brought you know, her back, but that caused an Ishmael to be born, which is now still a problem between those nations. Can you believe that? The Arabic nations and then the Israel nation. So, and, and God said that to Hagar. You know, I will bless you with a son, but he will be 
and adversity to all men. So think about that. I mean, think about, read these stories and think about the warnings and the consequences when we get ahead of God's plan because we think our plans are just, you know, we got it figured out in our heads. So we got it calculated and it's going to work out. Really, I heard from God. No, you heard from your own voice. You heard from your own voice. Have you ever jumped ahead of God? Right? If so, these are the questions that I'm asking you guys. If so, what caused you to become impatient? You know, you can, you don't have to tell me the answers. You can, you can write them down and answer yourselves tonight. What happened as a result? What have you learned about God's timing both from his word and through your experiences of either obedience or impatience? Okay. But, you know, we need to learn these lessons and we need to remember them. Because, you know, they say history tends to repeat itself, right? But, no, we tend to repeat the same mistakes because we're hard-headed. We don't learn somehow from our previous mistakes. See, when the way you plan to run your day or run your life, okay, happen to be curtailed, slowed down, or stopped completely, what do you do? How do you handle it? The unbelief of impatience tempts you in two directions. One is to bail out and just completely give up, right? It's like we say, if there's going to be frustration and difficulty and challenges and struggles, forget it. I don't want to sign up for that. I won't keep this job. I won't stay in this marriage. I won't correct that child. I won't discipline that child because it takes too much time. I won't stay, you know, in, in this church. I will, I don't want to, I don't want to stay here and work at it. That's one way the unbelief of impatience tempts you to give up. The other side is Impatience tempts you to make rash counter moves against any obstacle in your way. It tempts you to be impetuous and hasty, right? You know, like there's a saying, haste makes waste, okay? So if you don't turn around and repent, you will be headed for sure destruction. So let's go turn to Luke. 27, 21, 19. And let's just look at some verses here to see how vital this battle of impatience versus patience and waiting on God. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. By your steadfastness and patient endurance, you shall win the true life of your souls. Okay? Remember that. That's longer. It's, is that amplified? Then in Romans 2, 7, to those who by patience in well-doing, or over here, in persistence in well-doing, springing from piety, seek unseen but sure, glory and honor and the eternal blessedness of immortality, he will give eternal life eternal life. God will give eternal life. Now, let's go down to Hebrews 6.12. Let me read my version here. Do not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So in these three verses that I just kind of rambled off to you, not only that it's talking about gaining eternal life, your true soul, but inheriting the promises. Do you not want to inherit the promises of God? I mean, I don't want to just hear about them. I want to experience them and live. Live according to his promises. And of course, his promises have conditions. And most of the times, he tells us what to do, and that is to wait. Wait. You know why he tells us to wait all the time? Because he wants to change us. He wants to change our priorities. 
You know, if he gave Abraham the son that he's been wanting, then, you know, during the time that he could still, you know, bear children, the, the childbearing age, then it's not really an impossibility anymore. See, when he gave Abraham Isaac at age 100 and Sarah was 90, that was all glory to God because they are both past their childbearing age. You know, Abraham may not have lived to see the many nations. He is the father of many nations. But the promise has been fulfilled. We still talk about him today. Amen. Patience is not an optional virtue for a believer. Okay. And patience in well-doing is the fruit of faith. Y'all believe that? You can't tell me you have faith if you're not patiently waiting on God. Because that's what faith is. Faith is trusting God when he says, move, you move. When he says, stop, you stop. Just like the cloud that they didn't understand. I mean, you know, that was a miracle. The cloud in, in the desert where the people, the Israelites, were following it wherever it went. Sometimes it went for hours or maybe even days. It felt like forever. And they're complaining, oh, my God, when are you going to stop? Right? And then it'll just stop. And they stop. That's how God does things. And that's just the way he does things. He does not need to consult with us. He does it because he's God and we're not. Amen. During Isaiah's day, Israel was threatened by enemies like Assyria. Okay. I like stories. I like stories in the Bible because they're like motion pictures to me. Let's go to Isaiah 30, verses 1 through 2. So during those times, God sent the prophet with his words to tell Israel how he wanted them to respond to the threat. Okay? But one time, Israel became impatient with God's timing. Because why? The danger got too close. Okay, the danger got too close. The odds for success were too small. So, woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel and carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make a league and pour out a drink offering, but not of my spirit, thus adding sin to sin. Realize that. Sin, adding sin to sin. Who set out to go down into Egypt and have not asked me to flee to the stronghold of Pharaoh and to strengthen themselves in his strength and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And over here, I just highlighted and bolded that they set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my counsel. God was furious. He was infuriated, okay, because he had given them instructions, and now they're making allegiance and partnering with the Egyptians, with, with you know, with, not with God and just totally disregarding God's instructions. How many here makes decisions without godly counsel? Do you know, if you claim to be a woman or a man of faith, if you have some life-changing decisions, you best believe you need some counsel because, you know, it's too late after you make that lifetime purchase or that lifetime vow, um, I think it's too late. You're just going to have to work it out whether you like it or not. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, when you feel impatient, preach to your soul. Talk to yourself. Read the word of God and speak life into your soul. Let's go to Isaiah 49, 23. This is one of the things that you should be telling yourself because I put my name there. Isaiah 49, 23. See, that's the long version. 
you know, it's those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Is that the right one? Isaiah 49, 23, right? Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. And if we go down to Isaiah 64, 4. Mines are one-liners. Are we there yet? 64, 4. No eye has seen a God besides you who works for those who wait for him. Isaiah has a lot to say about waiting. And finally, the most favorite verse of waiting, Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. This is a promise, y'all. Okay, it is a promise. If you wait upon the Lord, your strength will be renewed. So if you're feeling weary and tired, you must not have been waiting upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. He'll give you strength, new strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay, it's like an ever-ready battery. You're going and going and going because you've waited upon the Lord and he has renewed your strength. This is a promise that I hold on to because physically... I get tired, and spiritually, I may feel weary. But you know what? I remind myself that if I am waiting upon the Lord, he will renew my strength. Amen? Hallelujah. So if we want God to guide us, we must have the right perception of God. If he is our good, good father, then we should Trust him when he says, wait. Can we go to 20, Psalm 27, um, 14? Hmm. Psalm 27, 14. <clears throat> okay, it's just as long as mine. Wait and hope for and expect the Lord. Be brave and of good courage, and let your heart be stout and enduring. Yes, wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. See, when you read the word and when you speak the word, it encourages your soul. I don't know about you, but it encourages me. It reminds me of what I'm supposed to be doing. It reminds me of what I was waiting for. What am I expecting from God? What's been my prayer? So if we want God to guide us, our attitude needs to be right. First, we must be willing to think soberly, to think right. Okay? It's, um, it's unhealthy to um, demand inward impressions with no rational base okay so we have to consider the things of god and the word of god you know we have to use wisdom second we must be willing to think ahead and and uh what do you call that uh weigh the cost we need to be able to count the cost that's the word that i'm looking for count the cost not when you're in it but you count the cost. Don't just make foolish vows unto God. You know what you want and you know what God wants and you say, God, yes, I'm willing. I'm willing to follow you wherever you lead me and I'm willing to forsake all. All means all. Third, we must be willing to take godly advice. Third, right? I just said that. Be willing to take godly counsel because, you know, there are people that have been more spiritual and have been in relationship with God and know human nature better than you, right? And when you're facing a very important decision, you might want to ask for their advice, okay? 
The fourth one, we must be willing to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves. Okay? We must suspect ourselves, ask ourselves why we feel a particular reason um, of doing what we're doing and make ourselves give a reason as to why we're doing what we're doing. Does that make sense? You know, answer your own question. And if it makes sense to you and it is lining up with the word of God, then go for it. If not, run away from that decision. Fifth and finally, we must be willing, willing, willing to wait. Wait on the Lord is a constant refrain in the Psalms. And it is a necessary word for the Lord often keeps us waiting. So when in doubt, continue to wait on God. All right. Um, I just want to, before I close, I want to remind you of the story in the book of Acts. You know, when before Jesus ascended, it was when he resurrected already from the, from the dead and he had a meal with the disciples. Remember that part? And he was getting ready to ascend, and he gives them specific instructions. Three things, okay? He says, go to, uh, d go to Jerusalem and stay there, okay? Um, he wanted them to wait. That's number one. Wait, and then he told them where to do it. Where? Jerusalem. And he told them to wait for the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So don't go anywhere. You wait. And if you're going to preach the word, stay in Jerusalem. Okay? And don't do anything until the Holy Spirit, un until the promise of the Father comes. So they're thinking, okay, wow, what is the plan? I'm sure, you know, th there's a big plan. But he says nothing of any sort. He just says, wait. They don't know how long they were supposed to wait. How long, Lord? Nothing. No further instructions. But it finally happened. The day of Pentecost, where over th about 3,000 people got saved. And see, if they did not wait, okay, I'm sure they had plenty of reasons why they wanted to leave Jerusalem. That's where they crucified Jesus. That's where the murder happened. That's where the crucifixion happened. So I'm sure they wanted to run away as far as possible away from Jerusalem because, hey, if they crucify the Lord and you're a follower, there's a likelihood that they will crucify you too or torture you or persecute you, right? So, you know, I'm sure they're thinking, hey, Jesus said to spread the gospel, the good news. Um, what better way to uh, go away and spread the good news? hey, that'll work for me, you know? But they didn't do that, thankfully. They obeyed. They stayed, and what happened? A miraculous, you know, uh, salvation of many souls happened that day. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where it happened. That's what they were waiting for, the promise of the Father that they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they started speaking in tongues where other people who were observing thought that they were drunk but see if they did not wait and they just you know happen to convert many sinners then they would not have given the glory to god see the thing that god is teaching us it's not to be mean and not to and not to give us what we were praying for just to be mean he is teaching us a principle of totally depending upon him because if he gives us our prayers right away answered, then what do we need him for? Then we're going to rely on our prayer and not on God. We're going to rely on our faith and not on a relationship with the living God, that we're not relying and trusting and waiting upon him because, hey, I can just ask and I receive right now, right away. You know, forget about that misconception because you know what? That's, I know we've heard that. Name it and claim it in Jesus' name. But what about if that's not what he was willing to give you? But, you know, have you ever had that? What about if you've had a loved one die and you were praying and praying and praying for their healing and it did not happen? 
How does that affect your faith? It's not about that. It's about your relationship that no matter what, if the answer was yes, no, maybe so, or wait, you're still going to serve God. You're still going to trust God. You're still going to walk in the light of his word because you believe, because you trust him. You're not getting ahead of him. He is God and you're not. Amen? And the closing scripture, if we can go to Philippians 4, 11. Amen. You know, he makes us wait because he wants to purify our motives. He, he wants us to just be solely focused on him. Are you discontent trying to get ahead of God? You know, you don't like where you're at right now. So, you know, we have this problem where we're constantly thinking of the future. You know, we look way back in the past, okay, and, and we dwell there. And then when we're uh, praying for a blessing, we're so looking forward to the future that we miss the present. We miss to enjoy the present. Enjoy your present. That's why it's called present. It's a gift. I read that somewhere. I'm sure you've seen that too. Are you dissatisfied with life in the present tense? Live your life now in faith. Don't allow yourself to get ahead of God. Contentment is not being stuck in the past or it's not getting ahead of God. Contentment is a life of trust in the present in which the Holy Spirit enables you to say, I have learned to be content. Not that I am implying that I was in any personal want. Are you guys there? Philippians 4.11. For I have learned how to be content, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted in whatever state I am. Amen. So if you've experienced being with or without, rejoice anyway. That's what God said. That's what Paul was telling the church, rejoice always. In all things, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice and wait on the Lord. Amen.